It's a great privilege uh, for the Centre for Independent Studies to host this event today. I want to say also uh, that we should pay our respects to the victims of the El Paso, Texas shooting a few moments ago. Our thoughts and prayers are with them. A CIS is a public policy research organisation that is committed to promoting the principles of classical liberalism, but we're also strong supporters of the US alliance, which has been for nearly 70 years, is and will continue to be the centrepiece of Australian foreign policy. In a moment, we'll hear from the Secretary of State and afterwards we'll have a conversation for 10 minutes. To introduce the Secretary, I'd like to call on our next speaker. Uh, Maurice Payne is the Foreign Minister of Australia. She's a former Defence Minister for three years from 2015 to 2018 and she's been a Senator of the State of New South Wales for the last 22 years. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Maurice Payne. Good luck, Maurice. All the best. Sarah. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet this afternoon and pay my respects to their elders past, present uh, and emerging. Good afternoon and thank you very much, Tom, for your uh, introduction and thank you to you and your staff at the Centre for Independent Studies for uh, hosting us here today, although perhaps uh, more appropriately, I think, should be thanking State Librarian John Vallance for hosting us here in these beautiful surroundings this afternoon. To my counterpart, with uh, whom you will speak soon, US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, thank you for our fruitful discussions that we've had earlier today during this year's Osmin. And Susan, you are very, very welcome here in my beautiful home city of Sydney, in the great state of New South Wales uh, as well. May I acknowledge uh, many parliamentary colleagues, current and former, but particularly my good friend and former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, and the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, uh, Penny Wong, who is here with us today, also Shadow Foreign Affairs spokesperson. To the Secretary of my Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Francis Adamson, uh, their excellencies of, uh, of many uh, who are here this afternoon, but particularly Australia's Ambassador to the United States, Joe Hockey, and the United States Ambassador to Australia, A.B. Culverhouse, and the very many distinguished guests who are here this afternoon. It is indeed a distinguished audience and the most appropriate audience to hear the very important words of my counterpart, Mike Pompeo. We have a lot of US friends here in my hometown of Sydney this weekend. And this is a city which has played host to many key moments in the long friendship between our two nations. And I want to share just one story. Because our Australian-American connection goes back to the very beginnings of this city's European history. In fact, we are told that the first European, broadly speaking, to fish in Sydney Harbour was an American. Jacob Nagel was from Reading, Pennsylvania. He fought in the American Revolution against the British, both at the Battle of Brandywine and in George Washington's artillery at Valley Forge. After transferring from the, Navy, from the Army to the Navy, he was ultimately captured by the British and taken to St Kitts in the Caribbean in chains. He was then freed by the French Navy, but went on to serve in the Royal Navy, including alongside Lord Nelson in the Napoleonic Wars. But it was with the British that he arrived in Sydney as part of the First Fleet, just a stone's throw from where we meet now at what is now known as Circular Quay. Of course, just five months after the First Fleet arrived in 1788, the American founding fathers were ratifying their new constitution. Nagel lived here in the colony for three years. And fascinatingly, his original memoirs, the manuscript handwritten itself, remains housed in this building, right under our feet. They paint a compelling picture of life in the new colony, and they remain a seminal part of the story of how 
European Australia began. The US Constitution, of course, is an enduring document, now some 231 years old, and still enshrines those values of freedom of speech, freedom of political assembly, the right to due process, the separation of powers, amongst others, by which we live and abide. Indeed, our own Constitution's framer, Andrew Inglis Clark, was strongly inspired by the American founding document. Today, with Secretary Pompeo, we have underscored the values that we share in our joint statement following the Osmond discussions. And in 2019, they form the basis of our common effort to shape an Indo-Pacific region that is open, rules-based and inclusive. A region in which countries enhance stability, adhere to international law and respect one another's sovereignty. We will do this by working together, but also by raising strong partnerships across the Indo-Pacific. Our values are the fabric from which these deepening partnerships will be woven, and we must therefore remain committed to them even when we and they are challenged. Today, we of course discussed both of these major powers are tremendously important to Australia, and it's not in our interests for those relationships to become confrontational. But we do have to recognise that we are in an era of strategic competition and we must play our part in protecting our interests and advancing those values. As Prime Minister Morrison has said, this means we must sometimes be upfront about the concerns raised by the US. They're legitimate, they are shared, such as intellectual property theft and industrial subsidies. At the same time, we have to also be clear that protectionism is not the answer. As the Prime Minister also said recently, US-China trade tension should be resolved in a way that is consistent with the rules-based order and doesn't undermine the interests of other parties, including Australia. And where the rules-based order is incapable of dealing with new or evolving practices, we have to evolve with it and evolve it to both repair and maintain that rules-based system so that it can respond adequately. Rules adapt to circumstances, changing technology, for example, but values endure. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce Secretary Pompeo, a West Point graduate, first in his class, served in Germany before the wall came down, graduated in Harvard Law, practiced law in Washington DC for a few years, then moved to Kansas to start his own business with a few buddies, I'm told. Ran for Congress, served several terms, then was asked to become the director of the CIA. For me, Mike Pompeo is a vital counterpart, a strong leader, values focused, and a good friend. Please welcome. Secretary Mike Pompeo. Good afternoon, everyone. It always concerns me though when you applaud before the speech. So, <laughs> so hang on, see what I say and see, see, see what you think. Um, I was reminded, I walked there a little bit earlier and I saw these card catalogs in the library. It reminded me, I, I've used those. I see you young people, you have no idea what's in those drawers. <laughs> it reminds me how old I am. Uh, it's great to be with you all today. Uh, for Mr. Payne, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, we had a great meeting this afternoon alongside our counterpart, uh, Minister Reynolds, and uh, my new counterpart, Mark Esper. Uh, and we, you and I had just seen each other in Bangkok, so I'm sure you're getting sick of me by now. Uh, and I'd be remiss too if I didn't extend my thanks to the people of Australia for such a warm welcome here uh, for myself and for Susan. Uh, the same goes for those of you who are here today, the dignitaries, including uh, Minister Turnbull, uh, Penny Wong, the Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Hockey, uh, our Ambassador A.B. Colvahouse, Jennifer Westicott, the Chair of the Business Council, and Dr. John Valance, uh, the New South Wales Librarian, who's responsible for this uh, amazing place that we find ourselves today. 
And of course, a special thank you to Tom Switzer and the Center of Independent Studies for hosting us here today. I look forward to taking your questions. Um, we'll see if you can stump me. Uh, it's entirely possible. Uh, I also want to congratulate Prime Minister Morrison on his recent victory. Uh, my wife Susan and I have been in campaigns before we know how raucous they are, and thank you for uh, your willingness to serve. I look forward to we have a chance to see he and his wife tonight, uh, and we're very much looking forward to that. I know, too, that President Trump and the First Lady are looking forward to hosting them in the White House for a state dinner at the end of next month. Uh, and I'd like to take some time today, too, to talk about uh, things that matter. Uh, the reason that I came here, that's the relationship, the unbreakable alliance between our two countries and how uh, we on the American side see this developing. Uh, I'll keep my remarks short because I'm eager to set, get Tom up here and have a go, uh, and we'll take some questions. Uh, I wanted to get here. Uh, it was important for me to get down here. American diplomacy depends on showing up especially talk with your closest friends. Uh, not give lectures. This is a new era. America doesn't do that. Uh, the Trump administration knows your uh, partner. We are not your professor. Uh, I want to tell you about a story uh, about a man who epitomized what our friendship is all about here. Uh, your prime minister told it to President Trump last year, but it's so good that I'm going to steal it. Uh, his name was Leslie Allen, but everyone in his brigade called him Bull. Bull was an Australian who carried a stretcher during World War II and won admiration for fearlessly rescuing comrades wounded in the battle, on the battlefield. In 1943, American and Australian troops were fighting side by side in what was then the territory of New Guinea, taking very heavy casualties. That didn't stop Bull, thus I suspect the nickname. He relentlessly raced back into the fray over and over again. When all was said and done, Bull had delivered 12 wounded Americans to safety, even carrying them on his back. Of course, here is Bull received America's Silver Star. Now that's what I call showing up for your friends. Uh, this is a friendship. Our friendship is one that was truly meant to be. History reflects that. We are continental democracies. We are nations of strivers. We've both been through national struggles for civil rights and emerged the other side far better for it. We set an example for the world to follow each and every day. Now, don't get me wrong, we're not exactly the same. <laughs> I had an earpiece in case I needed a translation today <laughs> uh, from your reporters. But when, it, <laughs> but, when we, but, but when it comes to the things that really matter, the things that we all value so much, democracy, the rule of life, res uh, respect for human rights, this is why we fought side by side in World War I and in World War II and in Korea, and in Vietnam, and in Iraq, and in Afghanistan today, and in Somalia, in our ongoing battle against ISIS. And of course, we share the ultimate bond, a commitment to come to one another's aid and to act to meet threats against one another's homelands via the ANZUS Treaty. Americans will never forget how we invoked it, how you invoked it after 9-11. Treaties should mean something. I know that the one between our nations does. But remembering those old glories matters, and it's wonderful, but it's not enough. It's not a keep enough, enough to keep our people safe today, or our people prosperous, or our people free. Nations need to know today who's with them, and for the long haul. And it's true that you have your own perspective on the Pacific, but it's not all that different from ours. Uh, it's true that other competitors are out there, but you're learning that all that glitters is not gold. It's true that the United States can sometimes, I'm sure, seem far away. Uh, it's a long flight between us, as I just experienced. As the pilot said it was headwinds, I'm pretty sure it was just a big ocean. Uh, but if there's one thing, if there's one thing I want you to know today, it's this. The United States is a Pacific nation. I grew up on the shores of Southern California, uh, and we are here to stay with Australia as a friend and as an ally. You heard me say earlier that I had great meetings with Minister Payne in Bangkok and today. Singularly, my biggest takeaway from those conversations is that the days of Australia as a middle power are coming to an end. It's a good thing for the region. It's a great thing for the world. It's a turn that the United States welcomes because you stand for the same things that we do. Transparency and the rule of law basic human dignity, and 
freedom. Responsible trade and investment. Partnership, not domination. You know, we've seen this as you've stepped up in the Pacific. We welcome your new diplomatic posts all across the neighboring islands. We're grateful for your focus on Southeast Asia and your commitment to fighting crime in the Mekong region. We're delighted as well to see Australia support regional infrastructure projects, projects that are open, transparent, corruption-free. And we commend your decision to investigate what Confucius Institutes are really doing on campuses here in your country. That builds on your courage to shine light on state-sponsored election interference as well. And the United States is prepared to work right alongside you to ensure that every nation can have free and fair elections. You know, nearly two years ago now, we deployed our free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. It's one that fits with your approach as well. In fact, we borrowed the name from you. <laughs> uh, we both know the principles we love will strengthen the region. Implementing them starts, as always, with diplomacy. We had a great trilateral meeting in Bangkok with our Japanese friends. We've worked together in what we call the Quad, and we are revitalizing it. It continues, too, with military cooperation. I was a soldier once not so long ago. And today, we're conducting military exercises that would have been unthinkable alongside our allies, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan, as well as New Zealand. And we've taken new steps to reassert the rule of law throughout the South China Sea. We all need to do more. Now, economically, and I know there are many senior business leaders here with us today, and I'm thankful for that. Economically, we are your number one source for foreign direct investment. And we're proud of that. We do more than $65 billion in trade each year, and President Trump is always eager to find ways to boost America's numbers. And we're encouraging some of our best and brightest towards the success in this region, too. Today, I have the honor to announce the creation of four Indo-Pacific Fulbright scholarships, two funded by the United States and two funded by your great country to conduct research on the Indo-Pacific region. So with this good foundation in place, let's crack on as allies in our shared Pacific home and all over the world. Let's help our neighbors secure their economic independence. We can get the Papua New Guinea electricity project we started last year over the finish line. I know we will. Foreign Minister Payne said she would turn the first shovel when I was with her today. Let's help other countries, too, in the region meet their energy needs. Strong nations prove their metal when we tackle those security challenges together. Australia has supported our efforts to put pressure on North Korea to enforce the UN Security Council resolutions that have the opportunity to take a nuclear threat away from the entire world. And you've shown true leadership in making sure that your sovereign decision to protect your 5G networks will work. But I, I know we can do more, and we talked about some of it today. Australians know the scourge of terrorism. How can we better stop fighters that are in Syria today from returning, from setting up camp in Southeast Asia? The United States and Australia depend on freedom of the seas so that we can each have prosperity. And I'm convinced, too, that we can work together to keep all shipping lanes open, even those that are further away in the Strait of Hormuz. Let's do more through meaningful, effective multilateralism, not empty gestures. It's one thing to talk. It's another thing, of course, to do. And we've built good new momentum. We built momentum within the Quad, and there's lots of room for growth. Let's get more done through the Pacific Islands Forum as well and through ASEAN, where Foreign Minister Payne and I spent the last two days. I hope, too, that those of you who are in business here uh, will visit and attend the Indo-Pacific Business Forum that will be held in Bangkok in November, a real opportunity to build economic ties between the United States, Australia, and all of the countries in the region. It's a great chance for government and business leaders to explore new investments throughout the region. I want to end by, by quoting what one Australian writer said about our friendship back in 1910. He said, quote, the United States and Australia are neighbors, united rather than divided by the vast emptiness of the Pacific waters. They face with an unchanging front of friendship. Together they pursue the high ideals of brotherhood, liberty, and judgment, of, a man by his own inner, of judging a man by his own inner worth rather than the accidents of birth or good fortune. That's a fancy way to say uh, that this, the way this guy from Kansas would put it. 
Uh, but the point stands. We're Pacific friends, bound together by an ironclad commitment to our shared values and our joint success. And I am confident that this unbreakable alliance will maintain them now and forever. Because that's what friends do. God bless you. God bless Australia and the United States. And God bless me as I take questions from Tom today. <laughs> Thank you all. And I'd like to call on uh, the Foreign Minister, Maurice Payne, too, for the questions as well. Secretary. Uh, is this, just, by the way, your first trip to Australia? It is. It is? Right. Yeah. I bet you haven't uh, experienced winter days like this in Washington <laughs> or your uh, hometown of Kansas. Well, when I return home, it will be 94 <laughs> and muggy. Yes. I did point that out earlier. <laughs> right. This is winter in Sydney. Enjoy. Yeah. Now, listen, um, I know you did an event recently uh, in Bangkok two days ago. You did a Bloomberg event similar to this, and you talked about North Korea, trade, Hong Kong. I want to focus more on Australia and the US-China relationship. Start with some breaking news. A few hours ago, the new Secretary of Defence said this afternoon that since missiles treaty has expired, the US is keen to explore getting missiles in, around allies in Asia. Does that mean that, al that allies like Australia should expect missiles in Darwin? Well, uh, what I think Secretary Esper was referring to is the we... Uh, we decided that leaving the INF Treaty was necessary. Uh, after years of work, uh, trying to convince the Russians to come back into compliance, uh, when 50 only 50% of a two-person treaty is complying, it's a really odd place to find oneself for years. And so President Trump made the decision to recognize the reality. And so um, we've, we've now begun to take actions which will begin to catch up with where the Russians are uh, so that we too can have the, the ability to do the, uh, per perform the functions that are with those. As for where we'll put those, uh, frankly, decisions on force deployments, missile deployments, all of the things we do around the world are things that we constantly evaluate. We, we want to make sure that we're protecting our partners, protecting American interests. Uh, I think our efforts to deploy our resources, our defense resources to create uh, deterrence and stability around the world are something we're always looking at. Uh, and we're happy to do it, and we will do so with deep consultation with every partner. Now these, uh, these missiles have a 5,500 kilometer range. Shanghai to Darwin is 5,000 kilometers in range. Um, how would Beijing feel if Australia had missiles in Darwin, Foreign Minister? Well, I think it's important to remember that the US has had a strong military presence characterized in a number of ways throughout our region for a very long time now. And, uh, and we have welcomed that, we have engaged with it, uh, we have worked with it. Uh, but I think it would be unfortunate to, uh, or to characterize it uh, in the, in the way that you have, uh, we obviously uh, respect and support the, uh, the US's uh, withdrawal from the INF Treaty. The Secretary makes a very good point about uh, a treaty with uh, two parties in it where only one is, uh, is pulling forward. But uh, for us, uh, these are strategic decisions for the United States, and I'm sure they'll be made in consultation uh, with key partners as the Secretary's outlined. Okay, now you mentioned the Confucius Institutes on Australian campuses. And as you well know, the Australian government of Prime Minister Turnbull rejected Huawei and the 5G network. It's been a very tumultuous relationship between Beijing and Canberra. Mr Secretary, how worried should Australians be about the rise of China as a great power? Uh, it's really straightforward. Uh, we, we have, in the United States, deep economic relationship with China. We think there's real opportunity there. Um, but uh, we have to be very, very uh, careful. America sat, I think the world, frankly, watched for too long. Uh, we were asleep at the switch as China began to behave in ways that it had not done before. Uh, so whether that's efforts to steal data across networks, which you just referred to in terms of the decision Australia made, or militarize the South China Sea, something President Xi promised the world he would not do, or uh, engage in activities where they uh, uh, foist money on nations that are desperate for resources and leave them trapped in debt, debt positions, which ultimately aren't about commercial transactions but are about uh, political control. Uh, those are the kind of things that I think everyone needs to have their eyes wide open with respect to. The United States certainly does. And we welcome China's continued growth, uh, but it's got to be right. It's got to be fair. It's got to be equitable. It's got to be reciprocal. They have to behave in a way that ensures that the value sets that Australia and the United States have continue to be the rules by which the entire world engages. Now, you mentioned the militarization of the South China Sea. Three years ago, uh, last month, the Hague a rule that China's conduct in the South China Sea was illegal. Minister, you mentioned China's illegal conduct in the South China Sea, and the governments of Australia, America and Japan put out just recently a trilateral statement calling out China 
over its coercive unilateral actions and also supporting cooperation in the Pacific. If China's conduct is so outrageous, Minister, why hasn't Australia done follow-up freedom of navigation patrols through that contentious 12 nautical mile zone in the South China Sea? Well, Australia makes uh, our own decisions about how we uh, engage uh, in the region, of course. But I think that uh, any examination of the uh, ADF uh, participation and engagement in the region would show you a very significant uh, high level of activity and a level of activity which clearly prosecutes our case for freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight according to international law in this region and, in fact, more broadly. Most importantly, we have been consistent in, uh, in pursuing the uh, application of international law, the application of the UNCLOS in relation to uh, any of the disputes in the South China Sea to which we are not a party and nor do we take sides on, the, on claimants and, uh, and their interests. But we have consistently advocated for the application of the UNCLOS in international law. We have reiterated that at every opportunity, including as recently as uh, my participation in both the East Asia Summit and the, uh, and the ARF in uh, Bangkok this week. Uh, and in uh, every other opportunity uh, we have in terms of making public comment. So Australia is a very consistent messenger on this uh, matter. We are a consistent partner with our friends, the United States. We work very closely together, but we'll always make our own decisions in Australia's national interest. Um, I may just add something there. Uh, sometimes um, I'll hear folks talk about uh, trade and economic issues as separate from national security. Let's make no mistake about it. China's capacity, the People's Liberation Army's capacity mm. to do exactly what they're doing is a direct result of the trade relationships that they developed. They, they grew their country on the backs of a set of unfair trade rules. Uh, so they were able to grow their economy at a high rate of speed in their t and to steal technology and to force technology transfers. Those very same economic tools that President Trump is so focused on fixing are what also have enabled China to do all of the things they're doing with their military all around the world. It underwrites their capacity to build a military. On Thursday night in Canberra, CIS is hosting a debate in front of about 500 people. Professor John Mearsheimer, uh, a West Point graduate like yourself, University of Chicago, he'll be debating Professor Hugh White, some say one of our leading strategic thinkers. Let me put Hugh White's argument to you. China buys double what our next largest customer, Japan, buys from us. The Chinese economy will grow much bigger than America's in coming years. Our China ties saved us from the global financial crisis. As a result, and this is Hugh White's argument, Canberra would be unwise to support Washington in a confrontation with China that America probably cannot win. Mike Pompeo. Yeah, look, um, you, can, you can sell your soul for a pile of soybeans or you can protect your people. Our, our mission set is to actually do both because we think it's possible to achieve both of those outcomes. We think it's possible to have trade with China and yet require them to behave in the, with the same set of rules. A, a, company that, a Chinese company that wants to invest in the United States has one set of rules, vis a, an American company that would like to invest in China. No, no, no country, no civilization permits this kind of imbalance in rules for an extended mm. period of time and survives. And so our, our effort is to, to restore that re reciprocity, to restore that balance. You don't have to give up all those good things that China does by uh, selling and trading with okay. you. Um, I, I will tell you this too, we have, we have a lot of trade here too. We invest an awful lot in foreign but direct investment here. Uh, and I know these businesses out here would love to do more. Does and Washington we, and they'd still love to, do it, they'd love to do it with the same set of rules. Does Washington still believe unequivocally that the ANZUS Alliance obliges Canberra to America's side in the event of a conflict? Re I'm sorry, repeat the question. The ANZUS Alliance, does oh, that yes. oblige us to Australia's participation in any conflict. Yeah, the answer treaty is un unambiguous. <clears throat> okay, but 15 years ago, Minister, your predecessor, Alexander Downer, uh, said uh, in Beijing to an ABC journalist, quote, Washington could not expect Australia to automatically side with the US if China attacked Taiwan. Is that your view? You can expect me to be responsible for a lot, Tom, but I'm not sure you can <laughs> expect me to be responsible for Alexander Downer's statements 15 years ago. <laughs> But isn't, he ref isn't Downer reflecting a segment of opinion that says increasingly Australia should be wary about getting too close to America in the event of a spat with China? Sec Mr. Secretary. The, the, the idea that somehow we're close to conflict in the military sense with China um, is, is what I think those who don't want to actually confront the real challenges that China present raise as the specter. Uh, we're, that, this is not the mission set. The mission set is very, very different. And, and can I say, uh, 
Mike and I haven't spent the hours between uh, 8 o'clock this morning and uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon uh, discussing the, the depth and breadth of uh, the US relationship uh, to, to bring it to, uh, to a point uh, of, uh, of like that. I mean, we have spent so much time today across uh, a vast range of policy areas and engagements uh, which illustrate uh, exactly the observation that Mike just made. There is so much to this relationship. Uh, predicated in uh, 100 years of mateship, uh, if you ask my friend uh, Joe Hockey, I was uh, enthusiastic about pointing out that we're in the second century now of that uh, 100 years of mateship, which makes me feel old, uh, <laughs> apart from anything else. But uh, there is so much more to uh, the Australia-US relationship, so much more to the values that underpin it, and so much more to the alliance uh, than just... Okay, uh, final point. The, the US government has flagged the prospect of Australia joining an international coalition to protect shipping in the Persian Gulf. Uh, Secretary, um, how can Canberra play a more important role as an ally partner in Asia and doing these freedom of navigation patrols in the South China Sea, for example, when it's constantly pulled back to the Middle East? Well, you have to get goods from A to B. <laughs> and if they, A happens to be the Middle, middle East, <laughs> you, you gotta get them through the strait. And so we're asking every nation to join. Uh, this is a deterrent against the bad behavior that the Islamic Republic of Iran has undertaken. They've pulled a British ship already. They've, uh, they mined and uh, uh, took on six other ships uh, from other countries, one of them a European ship, a Norwegian flagship. We're asking every nation that has energy needs, that has goods and services passing through to contribute to our effort, which is deter and create stability in the Strait of Hormuz. So we we're asking every nation, Australia and everyone, to come join us in that effort. Um, every, every country will contribute something different, information sharing, ships at sea, communication systems, ISR, all the, all the elements of delivering uh, this defensive deterrent posture in the Strait of Hormuz. Um, we're welcoming every country to join us in that effort. Mr. Secretary, thank you. And unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. The Secretary and the Foreign Minister are on their way to the next schedule. Please join me in thanking Maurice Payne and Mike Pompeo.